here's what I want to tell you about this idea of vision. Is that um, if we don't have vision, and if we don't have, have an idea of, of who we are as a church and what we're supposed to be doing uh, in, our communi- in our community, then the gathering that we have uh, right now, the things that we've been doing, really don't make any sense. You know, there's Super Bowl Sunday. There are a lot of us that could probably be out uh, getting ready for, for the party instead of being here and singing songs and listening to a guy preach and then going home. If there's not something more to, to this thing that we call church than, than just getting together and, and hanging out with people that we like and singing songs that we're familiar with and, and feeling uh, safe from, from, the, uh, from the outside world just, just for a moment, then, then we're really not following the pattern that Jesus left for us. We're really following a pattern that, uh, that, that Jesus uh, fought to, to, to destroy. Uh, if we're just kind of going through the motions, if we're just kind of doing things because, hey, that's just what we've always done, then we're, then we're playing into the same hands of the people that crucified Christ. Because Jesus came not only to seek and to save, but to set out the vision for who we're supposed to be. And I think as a church, sometimes we forget about that. Because the world is so scary, so busy. It's, it's, it's changing. Uh, every time you, you turn around, there, there's something new. I mean, I mean, for crying out loud, and this is not a political statement, but did you ever think that you'd be saying President Trump? You can laugh. It's okay. It's a safe place. I mean, the Simpsons had him as President Trump on the Simpsons, that little cartoon show. And we never thought that we would say that. And, and you know what? You might as well laugh about it. You might as well get used to it because that's the reality that we're in. And so what we're is we're, we're hearing all this stuff and we're dealing with this stuff and we're not laughing at things that are funny because we're in church. And this is a place to escape from all of that. Church is not an escape. It is preparation to go out and bring the kingdom of God to people who are in dire need of it. No matter how old you are, no matter how young you are, there's a vision for the church. And that vision requires, first of all, maybe loving your church. One of the things that I, that, that I, that I read a lot about anymore and I hear a lot of people is, is there's, there's an organization right now that um, it seems like it's fair game uh, to criticize is it's the church. Um, I, I read articles all the time and, and I even talked to you a little bit about a, about a guy who struggled because you know the church kind of he had some bad church experiences he, 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 saw, he thought the church was full of hypocrites and, and, and so I, I read articles all the time and I talk to people and, 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 and when you get done talking to them you, you just wonder man what church do you go to that, that's a horrible place. And, 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 and they just talk about how, how bad everything is, whether, whether it's the, the color of the, of the carpet isn't, isn't really inviting or, or, or whether the preacher uh, preaches too short or, or, or preaches too long or, or, or whether, whether the music is, is, is too loud or it's too soft or, or, or it's not as good as it used to be or it's not as modern as it should be. And, and then you hear people talk about when they walk into the church, oh, you know, there's just a bunch of hypocrites. I, I did business with this guy. He didn't do me right. And so, so he was sitting there in church. And so I just, I just can't go into that church because he goes there and, and there's all this criticism. And, and by the end of it, you're, you're like, wow, you know, um, I'm sorry. And then when you top it all off, all that criticism is coming from the person that goes to the church. He talks about how much he loves the church. And then he invites you to come after he's told you all the bad stuff about it. Right? 
see, we have so many people spending all their time talking about these things, and, and they're really not talking about the vision of the church. What they're talking about is they're talking about how people do church wrong. And see, the problem with this is there's a fundamental under, misunderstanding between what doing church is and what being the church is. Now, I'm not going to say that there's, that there's not issues in the church. I'm not going to say that there's not hypocrites. I'm not going to say that there aren't things that are, that, that are not perfect with, within the church. But I'm, but I'm going to tell you this. At the end of the day, it has nothing to do with doing church. It has to do with, with being the church. And with all of the negativity that I hear and, and all the stuff that, that people come to me and talk to me about, I want to tell you this. Because if you think this is going to be about bashing the church, it isn't going to be about bashing the church at all. Because here's what I believe about the local church. Not just the church universal, but I'm talking about individual local churches. I believe that the local church is God's only plan to reach the world. Are you with me? Do you believe that? The local church, Broken Arrow Nazarene Church, Life Church, Core Church, the Assembly of God Church, the Christian Church, that is God's only plan to reach the lost. I believe that with all of my heart. There is no plan B. I had a staff member once when I, when I talked about this idea of, of there is no plan B when it comes to the church, and he kind of he kind of he kind of argued with me a little bit, and he was like, "Well, you know, I understand what you mean. That there's no plan B." He was trying to be really philosophical with me, and finally I just stopped him and I said, "Hey." Show me plan B. If you can show me in Scripture anywhere where there's plan B, where, where, where the church isn't the tool that God wants to use to reach uh, the entire world, show it to me. Otherwise, be quiet and get to work with me. <laughs> And what ended up happening was, once as, 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 as a staff, he and I were on the same page, and, and we started forgetting so much about different things and stopped worrying so much about different ways of doing church and stopped giving voice to negativity about how church is being done wrong and how, and how everything's uh, going to hell in a handbasket and how generations aren't, aren't respectful as they used to be. When we started ignoring all of that stuff and we ignored it, and we start focusing people on doing the, doing the things that, that, that make us live together and become something, that's when things begin to change for us. In other words, when we got sick and tired of, of arguing about doing church, and we decided we were going to be the church, Everything changed. Now that was both exciting and terrifying. Because as everything changed and new people were coming in that, that had no church background, that, that, that new people were, were coming to the altars, people that were leading people to Jesus at, at their workplace, people were, were, were leading to them across the table at a fast food restaurant, and as they, were, they were coming to the church, and, and they didn't have any idea that we were doing church wrong. They just decided they wanted to be a part. They just decided that, that you know what, I, I want to be a part of, of, this, of this body of Christ that's, that, that's, that's investing in, in reaching the lost, that's investing in, in making a difference. They're, they're changing our part of the world. And 
And once they started becoming the church and seeing all this stuff happen, they couldn't get enough of it. They got over the hump of fear that James talked about. And he just realized that at the end of the day, all that really matters is that a church changes lives. Amen? See, when we talk about the vision of the church, it goes beyond what the building looks like. It goes beyond how good the music is. It goes beyond how long the preaching is. It goes beyond whether we, we, we call our discipleship small groups or Sunday school. It goes beyond all of that. It just goes to the place of remembering that the last thing that Jesus said before he left this earth was go make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. See, that's the vision for the church. That, that's the vision for the Nazarene church. That's the vision for Broken Arrow Nazarene church is to go. See, the reason that, that I love the church has nothing to do with great programs, good music, good buildings. The reason that I love the church isn't because I'm a pastor in the church of the Nazarene. The reason I love the church is because when our family most needed it, he was more interested in being the church to us than it was about doing church. I listened to a lot of people that knew my dad talk about what a good man he was and, and, uh, and, uh, and, and you just kind of smile politely when they say those things and, because they mean well. And I, and I love my dad, but my dad wasn't always a good guy. As a matter of fact, most of my life, I remember him not being such a good guy. But the moment that changed him and the moment that changed my family was the moment that the church decided to be the church to a really bad guy. See, the moment that, that it changed everything was, was, was not even the moment that, that uh, the Nazarene church picked me up on, the, on, a, on, on a school bus and took me to, to church. It wasn't the children's church. It wasn't the programs. It wasn't the choir. It wasn't any of that. It was at 2 o'clock in the morning, a man with a bad reputation called up the associate pastor of a, of a little church in, in Lynn, Indiana, and said, this is Gene Moore. Come over to my house right now. And hung up the phone. That's how small the town was. Everybody knew where he lived. And that man who, who called on the phone had a reputation of being a brawler and a boozer. And at 2 o'clock in the morning, an associate pastor knocked on the door of our house. Not knowing if he was coming to walk into a good thing or the worst butt kicking he ever got in his life. Because that's my dad. And at a coffee table, as bad as my dad was, at 2 o'clock in the morning, he gave his life to Jesus. And the end result isn't even necessarily heaven for him, even though that's where he is. But it's my story. See, I believe that if it had just been me going to children's church, I wouldn't be standing here. I remember a church that didn't leave us after that took place. That 
They, they embraced our family. And, and, and then when my dad lost his job, they embraced my mom. And I remember food poundings. I remember all that stuff. And, and, and as, we're, as we're thinking about that, many of you have stories about how the church did some of those things for you or the people that you knew. And, and, and there's this idea in our mind, oh, yes, to go back to those times. I'm not saying I want to go back. What I'm saying is I want to be the authentic expression of love right now where we are in the situation that we find ourselves in. You see, when we are an authentic expression of, of the love of God, then things happen. You see, we wonder why churches grow. We wonder why churches explode. And, and when we can't understand it, we say, oh, they're, they're cheating. They're doing this wrong. They're, they're, they're not giving the full message of Christ. And they're not doing this. And, and I'm going to tell you, every church that I've ever studied that's been growing, none of that criticism is true. You see, you don't get to see the things that they do. You just see the big thing. You just see what's happening. And, and, and because it's not particularly what you like or particularly what you're comfortable with, we come up with excuses why we don't want to do that. I can remember talking to a church and, and it was helping and consulting with this church and we were, we were just kind of walking through some different things and as I talked to him, I, I said, hey, well, tell me about your, 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 your sons and your, and your daughters and your grandkids. Oh, yeah, they used to come to church here. They went to Sunday school. They went to VBS. They, they did all these things and I'm like, oh, man, did they move away? No, no, they just live right across town. Oh, are they going to church anywhere? They're not going to church. Oh, no, they're, they're going to that other church over there. I'm like, oh, they're going to the other church? Well, yeah, I don't know why they're going to that other church. He says, you ever, you ever listen to their music? You, you, ever, you ever see how they, how they dress? You know, they, they, they have this, this big outreach thing that uh, I, don't, I don't understand. I, I, I went once, I don't get it. I said, ah, oh, okay. I said, then what are you willing to do to make this a place where your kids and your grandkids want to come? Oh, I'm willing to do anything until I gave them my suggestions. It's all, we can't do that. No, oh, we can't do that. Oh, we can't do that. And at the end of the day, I was told that it was a waste of money. And I was like, it's only a waste of money if you don't take my advice. It's only a waste of time if you don't, if you don't take my advice. That church closes doors. Not too long ago. Ariel Hall, great, great man of God. 93 years old. A few weeks, no, about a month ago, he fell. He broke three vertebrae in his neck. He's a guy from West Texas. Worked with my dad. Has a neck brace on, 93. Came to the funeral. Tough as nails. Him and my dad worked on, on the church growing up there. They, they mowed the yard. They, they did everything, even to the point where up until the time where Ariel fell down, he would not allow anyone to do anything at the church. They've seen kind of an uptick um, in, in attendance here, which is really exciting for me to, to hear that. There's a, a large college there, San Houston State University. They're, they're finally starting to, to draw uh, students uh, from San Houston State University, which we could never understand why we couldn't get them to come. And, and uh, my dad was telling me about it before he passed away. So they were going in there, and, and uh, the, the, the students were, were doing the, the praise band. And so you're seeing students come. You're seeing younger people start to come and starting to grow a little bit. And, and as I was talking to the pastor at the funeral, he was talking a little bit about R.L. And he said, R.L. came up to me one day. 
I said, Pastor, you know we're not singing hymns. And uh, he said, okay, all right, no problem. He says, well, we'll, 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 we'll look at some hymns. I'll talk to him, see if they'll, they'll, they'll play some hymns. And, and R.L. thought for a minute, just his glasses. Whenever he would try to do this, he knew he was thinking really hard. He said, nah. He said, I don't think I would recognize it the way they play anyway. But he said it with a smile. Because then he told the pastor, I can remember a day we couldn't get him to come into the door. He says, it's okay with me. They don't get any tougher and more conservative than a 93-year-old West Texas rancher. Because at the end of the day, R.L. realized that the vision of the church was not doing church. It was being church. And I know that sounds awfully simple when we talk about a vision for the church. I know that sounds awfully simple when we talk about, hey, where do we go from here? Um, Because here's the thing. This is tough. And I'm not, I'm not, I'm not trying, I'm not trying to, to, to minimize any of that. And I'm not trying to say that, 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 that one, this isn't even, a, this isn't about music. This isn't about any of that stuff. This is just about when, when anything that we do that you could consider doing church gets in the way of being the church, then there is a priority problem. There's a priority problem. It's not necessarily even a spiritual problem. It's just a, uh, it's just a place where, where we're struggling. And, and, and you know what? It's okay to struggle. It's okay to be a little bit fearful, but don't be so fearful that you fail to be a part of what God wants to do through your local church. Broken Arrow Church of the Nazarene exists. It exists to be and to train disciples of Christ. We exist to, to, to be out there and, 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 to, and to, to do outreach and, and to say, you know what, we're going to do whatever it takes to reach the lost. Whatever it takes to reach my, 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 my grandson, my, my son, my, my, my son's friend who, who, who used to eat us out of house and home. Those, those people who are on the, on the edges that, that, that they need Jesus more than anything. And I'm, and I'm willing to do whatever it takes to get there. And the problem with most churches is, not, a problem, not even most churches, some churches is, is they're, they're just not... It's not they don't know what to do. It's just they're not willing to get there. See, I find it amazing that we can get so focused in on things that at the end of the day can become idols for us. we're willing to miss out on God's greater blessing for us. See in Romans chapter 12 verses 9 through 13 I want to read it to you. There's five verses here but there's a lot of meaning in here and I'm not going to I'm not going to have time to to, to walk through every little thing because I could actually probably do four different sermons just on 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 the on the first verse that I'm going I'm going to read to you and I'm not going to do that I promise. I know I've been gone for a week and there's a tendency for me to try to preach two messages in one. But I'm not going to do that. But see, in Romans chapter 12, um, starting at, at verse 9, it says, Do not just pretend to love others. Really love them. Hate what is wrong and hold tightly to what is good. You see, right there, you have, you have keywords. You have love. You have hate. You have a hold. Um, um, you have the idea of what is good, and and so this idea of uh, right here in verse one that uh, we're supposed to agape without hypocrisy. 
When you look at the, at the, at the whole, at the whole uh, Greek uh, construct there, there's this, this love without, without hypocrisy. So this is what Paul's calling the church to be. Is you gotta, you got to love people uh, and you got to like them. You see, this idea that, oh, i got to love them, but I don't have to like them, that's not love. <laughs> that's love with hypocrisy. That, that's love with, with, with conditions. And what Paul's reminding us here is we're going to be the church and we're going to reach the people that we need to reach, that we've we got to get to the place where we don't just pretend to love other people, but we really have to love them. And not only that, we've got to hate what is wrong. You know, you can't, you can't compartmentalize wrong and, and right. There's, there's sin and, there's, and there's, there's, there's not sin. This is not a, a, really, a really popular teaching. A lot of guys don't want to preach on sin. I'm not going to stay there. Um, but, but there are things that sometimes is the church that we hold on to, that we say they're okay because everybody does it, that's in the top 10. I'm not even talking about stuff that's, that's just not pleasing to God. I'm just talking about the things that, that we teach our children, the Ten Commandments, and we say, hey, everything's okay. You're not supposed to lie unless lying can get you ahead a little bit. It's okay if it's a, if it's a business lie. It's not okay. <laughs> you know, there's got to be this, this horror of things, you know. What if the church really um, stood up in the United States because whether we want to believe it or not, the majority of religion in the United States is still Christianity. And instead of worrying about having it taken away, what if we just simply had a horror of sin and did everything that we could to keep people from being involved in that? What if instead of getting used as a pawn in a political system, we decided to be kingdoms of God? Citizens of the kingdom of God. What if we were really horrified about human trafficking? The church could end it. Amen? What if we were really horrified about poverty? The church could put a dent in it. Jesus is very clean. Clear, clear about poverty. The poor you will always have among you. But we could put a dent in it. What about injustice? If the church really was, 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 was against and, and was horrified about injustice, the church could stop it. Hold on to what is good. What is good, the Greek construct, is, is the essence of, of God. Holding on to the essence. See how, how much I could preach on every single one of these. The only reason I went through all of that is I want you to understand. Just sometimes we read uh, passages like this and, uh, and we, we, we say, oh, man, that's just common sense. Uh, don't pretend to love other people. Really love them. Hate what is wrong. Hold tightly to what is good. And we don't realize really what that means. There's a lot there. And then you move on to verse 10. Love each other with genuine affection. Again, this idea of not being hypocritical. There's this idea of, of loving people, not just loving them and I don't have to like them. Taking delight in honoring each other. When was the last time you were, you were genuinely delighted about something good that happened uh, with a friend or, or with someone in, in the body of Christ. Again, sometimes what happens is, is when something good happens, we're like, oh, so happy for you. And in the back of our mind, we're thinking, why uh, didn't that happen to me? You didn't deserve that. I know you. You're a jerk. <laughs> but this idea of loving each other with this chin affection. Can you believe it's been almost a year? I think it'll be a year in March, right? A year in March that I, that I came. And if you've ever doubted it, I love you. Genuinely. And I like you. 
be honest with you, I like you then more than I like some of my relatives. <laughs> Amen, right? <laughs> and so when I tell you this stuff, I want you to hear this. I am convinced that we're not even scratching the surface of the influence that we can have in this community if we'll embrace this vision that we're going to talk about for the next several weeks. Never be lazy, but work hard and serve the Lord enthusiastically. Never be lazy, but work hard and serve the Lord enthusiastically. Again, the Greek is to burn or to boil or to be hot with what is good. Much more. I mean, that takes on a whole different meaning, doesn't it, when you, when you look at it that way. It's this idea of, of, of just being overflowing and, and boiling. and Oh, there's something awesome here. Uh, verse 12, rejoice in our confident hope. Be patient in trouble and, and keep on praying. Verse 13, when God's people are in need, be ready to help them. Always be eager to practice hospitality. It's a pretty high calling for the church, isn't it? Some of us would even say that's impossible. But God's not in the habit of laying out an expectation and not giving you the ability to accomplish his great stuff. Stop pretending. Hate evil. Hold on to what is good. Look for ways to love instead of for ways to be seen as godly. I want to tell you something. If you'll love authentically, people will know you're godly. Serve together enthusiastically, not grudgingly. We're always in need of people to help with ministries. There's always ministries in the community that need people. And the worst way that you can go into those ministries is, oh, okay. If nobody else do it. It's not the vision of the church. Pray for the hope that God gives to override our natural always, always, always seek to help believers. Always, always seek to help those who are still searching. Anything you noticed about any of these things that we've talked about so far? Not one of them has anything to do with doing church. Not one. It's all about the mindset. It's all about the heart. It's all about the idea that there's a world out there that's missing out. And, and I think sometimes we, we approach it in, in a different way and we say, man, there's a world out there. It's all screwed up and they don't want what we, want, what we have. And, and that's not the, the case. The case is is there's a perception that people have about the church that is not true because we allow that perception to flourish by our focus on doing church instead of our focus of being the church. I can't control other people's perception of me no matter how much no, no matter how much I, I, I try, I can't control how, how people perceive me. You know, there, there are some people that perceive me as overweight. I don't know what they're talking about. I can't handle that perception. I can't, I can't change that. Actually, I could. I could lose some weight, right? I could live a healthy life. I don't want to be perceived as overweight. I shouldn't do things to my body that make me overweight. (laughs) Yeah, food is good. But sometimes the best stuff can kill us. 
if we overdo it. I think sometimes the church takes all the best things of church and we make that salvation. We forget about the debt we owe to the one that saved us. See, if we're going to be the church, the things that we're going to talk about in the next few weeks, we've got to get to a place where, where we enjoy gathering together on a consistent basis. I go to church this morning. Scott's been gone for two weeks. He's going to preach till noon. Maybe. I'm looking at the clock. <laughs> I, I apologize ahead of time. I, I promise I won't do this in the future. I really do. I'm working on it. So, not this long. We've got to be willing to grow by consistent gathering in, in small groups for learning and, and, for, and for friendship. Small groups matter. If you're not part of a small group, you're going to get sick and tired of hearing me talk about it. See, groups and, and churches that, that grow, churches that make a difference in their community, have a smaller place where people can get together and, and learn and, and love each other. I may give up on everything else that I talk about today but I'll die on that hill. We need to consistently be involved in ministry through the church or in our community. We need to serve. Here's what I'm okay with, church. I'm okay with 100 Nazarenes working at, uh, was it Broken Arrow Friends or whatever, Neighbors? I'm okay with 100 Nazarenes working at Broken Arrow Neighbors in the name of Christ. I'm not necessarily interested in, in starting another Compassionate ministry it's just so the Nazarene church can have its name on it. What says more, a church with a name on a ministry or 100 people working in a ministry? We'll talk about that. And then ultimately we have to multiply. See, this is where the vision is going to get really scary in a hurry. It's because I have a, a five-year vision that if we'll do all of these things and we'll be the church that Paul describes in the Romans passage that we talked about, is not only possible, but inevitable. Not only possible, but inevitable. And I'm not going to tell you what it is today. And so the response for something like this, what is it? Straighten up and fly right. Open the altars. Let's join hands and sing kumbaya. Nope. Nope. The response is to be continued. <laughs> Doesn't you hate that when you're growing up? They used to have that to be continued deal. You know? If you love your church, and this isn't guilt, okay? You might take it that way. And you are really interested in seeing Broken Arrow Church of the Nazarene make a difference in our community and around the world. Please, please, please make it a priority to be here for the next three weeks. This is too important to try to shove everything into one message. See, we have a lot of ideas of what church is. But is our idea God's? 
today. If you have a pen or a pencil, I want you to do this right now. I want you to write down Romans chapter 12, 9 through 13. Romans chapter 12, 9 through 13. I want you to read that again. Think about what you've heard today and ask the question, is my vision of the church match God's vision of the church? Have I invested my life in doing or being? I'm convinced it's time to be the church.